a model for autism. So this is an, an application that might actually be a shorter term patient benefit of stem cell research because it's all in vitro. Does that make sense? It's all in vitro. So this one's this is a picture from Zhang, um, Su Chu Zhang's laboratory at the Weissman Center. So again, the value of human embryonic stem cells to understand developmental disorders because they recapitulate differentiation of the neurotube into functional brain cells. So here's where we're trying to understand what pathways are involved in neurodevelopmental disorders. And in my laboratory, we use known disruptors of human development, such as valproate and alcohol. Valproate is an anti-epileptic drug, very effective for epilepsy. So women that are pregnant and are on valproate, they have to keep taking the drug because it's riskier for the baby for mom to have seizures during pregnancy than to be kept on the drug. But valproate, we know it's a disruptor of brain development. So what happens? In about 10% of the babies born to these women, these babies are diagnosed with autism or they have spina bifida. So that's a model that we've created. We've created human brain precursors and we expose them to how much valproate would cross the placenta, and then we use this technology called metabolomics to find signatures or biomarkers for what, what are the effects of these compounds of alcohol. And we also have a project that we're waiting to hear about funding to study the effects of environmental chemicals, such as PCBs, chlorpyrifos, mercury, on human brain development. So specifically, 10% of all birth defects are caused by environmental exposure. This is from March of Dimes. One in 250 pregnancies are exposed to anti-epileptic drugs, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are the leading known cause of birth defects and mental impairment in the US. This is also from the Department of Human Health and Human Services. So see, I wanted to show you a different aspect, perhaps, of human embryonic stem cell research that you hadn't um, been exposed to. So here's just an example of this metabolomics of human embryonic stem cells. We discover each line here is a small molecule, for example, <clears throat> a sugar or an amino acid or a fatty acid. So we identify these clusters of molecules that are up-regulated or down-regulated in human brain precursors in response to this, this drug that we know disrupts human development. And we hope that these could be applied to diagnostics. So and also in the route of in vitro systems, we can also extrapolate that benefit of stem cell research for cases like this. This was a clinical trial. This is published in Nature 2006 that where we could use human ES cells to potentially predict adverse reactions of chemicals on multiple organs. So this is a drug trial where every single healthy, it was a phase one, so the drug is exposed, administered to healthy individuals to question the safety, every single healthy individual that volunteered for this study almost died. And so here, the, rep the representatives for the company said there was no preclinical evidence whatsoever that the drug might be unsafe and that no adverse effects had been observed in rabbit and monkey studies. So does that make sense? Do you see where the value? So now if we can create human heart cells, human brain cells, and so forth, we can understand and perhaps identify quantifiable, sensitive, measurements to predict whether a chemical is going to be toxic to humans or not. This is another very exciting opportunity that also you probably don't hear a lot about. To me, it's one of the most exciting opportunities is discovering drugs for regenerative medicine. So I've worked inside a pharmaceutical company. Inside a pharmaceutical, each of these molecules is a compound. Okay, a drug. So when you take a pill, it's a small molecule, 
These are just the chemical representations, for example, Prozac or Gleevec, Reversin, okay? These are their chemical structures. So inside the pharmaceutical industries, we have millions. We have what we call libraries with millions of these chemicals. And before stem cell research existed, we could only we could discover drugs for obesity, Parkinson's disease, heart conditions, osteoporosis. Now we can discover drugs to potentially regenerate tissues. We could potentially discover chemicals that are going to recruit. We have dormant or we have populations of adult stem cells. Remember that I showed you in the first slide? So we potentially could identify drugs that are going to recruit those stem cells inside your brain and make them proliferate. There are cardiac stem cells, one, oh, so rare, one in 10,000 heart cells is a cardiac stem cell. But what if we could discover drugs targeted specifically at those cardiac stem cells to make them proliferate? So in that sense, we have identified compounds that induce, for example, differentiation of neurons, of heart cells, so this compound called cardiogenol. If you expose human embryonic or mouse embryonic stem cells to this compound, it induces the formation of heart. And then this is a very exciting compound called reversin. There are very few studies published on this, so it's very preliminary. But if you expose muscle cells to this compound, reversin, it was named because it's able to revert the identity of these cells. They de-differentiate and go back to stem cell-like progenitors. So then muscle cells are now able to generate fat cells and bone cells. So this is a very exciting new platform or a new research possibility. So one of our largest limitations, and I just wanted to bring this to your attention, is not to talk about the challenge, but actually to talk about how the private sector, the patient advocacy groups, and institutions like WARF have been critical to move stem cell research forward. Today, the NIH budget is roughly 28 billion dollars. The allocation of the NIH to human embryonic stem cell research is 24 million dollars. It's not one percent. It's 0 0.1 percent. What that means is that every single laboratory in this country is fighting, that does human embryonic stem cell research, that we're fighting for 24 million dollars. Just to give you put things into perspective, GlaxoSmithKline, the pharmaceutical company, just announced in one announcement that it's going to do with the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, it gave Harvard $25 million. So in one deal, one pharmaceutical company has allocated to one stem cell research center what the National Institute of Health allocates to all the stem cell research centers or the stem cell research scientists across the United States. So really, the engagement, the involvement, and the support from organizations such as Project ALS, JDRF, Michael J. Fox Foundation, WARF here at UW-Madison and the foundation has been really critical. And as you've heard, California itself has allocated $3 billion to stem cell research through the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. So from a scientist's perspective, I just wanted to give you my point of view, we really don't take the ethical concerns of our research lightly. We understand that there are ethical concerns, that we are working with human embryos. Again, these embryos have been discarded, but then again, but then again, we greatly respect the ethical concerns of the research. The way that I proceed personally is really through integrity, transparency, and strict conduct. So at any given time, we've had multiple visits to our laboratory. We show the research that we're doing, and we follow that research with integrity. So the opportunities for
with therapeutic intervention are real. If there was a 